Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Yeah, it's November. I know. I was just like looking at my calendar as we started this going, oh, I have to turn the page to write this one down. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's, we're recording on Halloween. Yes. Which is like probably one of my favorite days of the year. I love spooky season. Yeah, I mean, I I like it, but it always seems like it's such a like crazy day. Like once the kids mm-hmm. come home and like you're like, oh. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, my kids, all of their after school stuff was canceled for today, which I'm very thankful for because it was like a super hectic day because mm-hmm. we have football practice and art class and we we're supposed to eat at some point before we go right. to the meeting. So, but all of that got kiboshed, which I was real happy about. Oh, good. Yeah. That's yes. Good. So happy Halloween, everybody belated. Happy Halloween. I know we should have dressed up for recording. I actually do have on my I'm Fine shirt with the blood stains. Oh, gosh. Oh, I did. I saw the I'm Fine. I yeah. didn't see the blood stains on it. Oh, my yeah. gosh. You just stabbed <laughs> in the stomach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this was a costume of mine maybe last year, the year before. I can't remember. I actually wore it as a costume, but I need to. I don't have a costume this year. I didn't even buy a shirt like I said I was going to. Oh, yeah. I'm going as Taylor's mom. (laughs) I know. I saw your Crime Con shirt. I like it. What are you wearing for Taylor's mom? Just a shirt that says Kansas City Swifty. Oh. Because my daughter is Taylor. Yes. And dad is Kelsey. Right. Okay. (laughs) And she broke her foot. Oh, that's right. she's super upset because... She has to wear this like weird shoe, and she's like, "Mia's messing up my costume," and I'm like, mm-hmm. "And also, you can't walk very well." She's right, like, right, that too. Yeah, <laughs> she was more <laughs> upset about the, <laughs> the costume. <laughs> you need you need a golf cart. <laughs> we have a side by side. That's what we're gonna. Oh, use. that's right. That's right. You do. You yeah. have you have a built in one, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have an upscale golf cart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the plan. No, It'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hope everyone trick or treated and got lots of candy if that's your thing. You know no. what I saw? Oh, yeah, well, for sure. Well, I don't know if I told you the story, but I bought my candy at Sam's a while mm-hmm. back. Same. Sometimes I just I see it and I'm like, well, I'm gonna get it now and I'm gonna put it up on the shelf. So I put it up real high above like the cabinets in my laundry room, and I lo- totally told everybody like, do not eat these. Mm-hmm. This is for trick or treating. They're not mm-hmm. for you. I came back from Napa. And 50 Mm. of the 90 airheads were gone. Oh, my word. Who was the culprit? The little guy. One, two, or three. Yeah, okay. How'd you get them? And I also also, (laughs) also said, don't eat them. And also, do not climb on my new washer machine to get Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. He disobeyed two things that I asked him not to do. And then, and and I was just like, oh. So annoyed. I gave him this whole thing. And then I'm telling Emery and Emery's like, well, I opened the box because I took one. And I go, oh. so you broke my rule too. I know, but still, even if it was open, he's not supposed to eat them and he ate 50 of them. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> like full size airheads. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, so that reminded I'm, me when you I said like, I opened. I like airheads and I couldn't eat 50. Oh my gosh. I'm like, where are all these wrappers? Where are they? The well, majority of them went into the – well, that's where I found some of them. And then he found some in the basement. And then I, Anyway, it's fine. It's all <laughs> fine. But you reminded me of that when you said I hope – I was like, I'm not buying anymore. So the kid's here losing out now. Um, <laughs> anyway, and then the other thing I saw the other day on social media was a reel. And this lady, who's like our age probably, was like, y'all, new whatever generation have ruined – which is us actually – have ruined Halloween. She's like, Halloween used to be a time where we all got together with our friends. We roamed the neighborhood by ourselves. Our parents stayed home and handed candy out. We got to know Mary down the street and Bob and wreaked havoc and had fun. And now y'all walk around with your kids with your drinks and nobody's home handing out candy. That's true. I know. I'm like, why did we do that? Why did we do that? Because we wanted to have fun and have a drink? Like, no. We sit on the porch. Yeah. I'm rethinking yeah. my whole 
my whole evening. <laughs> and let them go. Let them go have fun. Who cares if they get into a little bit of mischief? That's right. the night. <laughs> Mischief night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay. So if you're listening, tell us what you do. Do you stay yeah. home and let your kids roam around or do you walk around with them? And can we all get together and change policy? Right. For next year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people around the neighborhood. You're like, oh, they're safe. Somebody is watching. But then you're like, there's so many people around the neighborhood. What if there's somebody in the neighborhood that shouldn't be here? Oh, and now see, now we're getting see? here. And this is why. Because we're crimey. Yeah, so did we ruin it or did society ruin it by yeah. being bad people? Murderers mm -hmm. and pedophiles ruined mm -hmm. it. A hundred percent. Okay. All anyway. right. Well okay. I'm 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 walking around now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of crime, mm -hmm. I have a crime for this okay. happy Monday. If you are ready for it, it is I have it here ready for sure. you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So today's case was recommended by our listener, Cammie D, who has recommended several cases to us over okay. the years. Today we are going to Iowa. I don't know if we've oh, been to Iowa. I don't know either. Yes. So we're going to be in a park called Gitche Manitou State Preserve. What the hell name is that? <laughs> so it's actually a native name and it means great spirit. Gitche Manitou means great spirit. Fantastic. I love that mm -hmm. name. But when you first said it, I was like, what? Gitche Manitou? Gitche Manitou. <laughs> um, so it's in Lyon County. It's a 91-acre preserve, and it's located in the most northwestern corner of Iowa. So it's right over the border of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Like, oh. Literally minutes right there on that like corner right there. That's where my husband was last week for work. Really? <laughs> Sioux Falls. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, we're going to be there, too. <laughs> um, so this case happened way back in the 70s, mm -hmm. which always makes it very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it involves five victims mm. and three killers. So it is a doozy of a case. Okay. All right. Yes. And it took me a real long time to research this case just because oh. there's so many players. But that's Did okay. you read a book for this, too? I read a book. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll okay. give it away. I'll talk about that. Yeah, well, if you ever give out a, uh, the other book Dude, away. I'm doing that today, okay? <laughs> oh, you forgot. I apologize to you guys. It's like weeks ago. I had a book that I needed to give away, and Christine, she literally said to me, listen, I was just on Instagram, and I saw the thing about that book giveaway. You should probably do that. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's fine. I know right where it is. I'm doing it today. Okay. Okay. On the morning of November 18th, 1973, a couple was test driving a new car, hmm. and they decided that they wanted to drive it through the park to look at the fall leaves. As they were driving, they noticed something strange on the side of the road and pulled over, and the man got out to see what it was and found three bodies of young people Ooh. laying in the grass. He could tell by the amount of blood on them and, like, how much blood was on the ground surrounding them that they were not alive. Oh, like, Clearly man. dead. So he got back in the car and drove to the nearest phone and called police. So the three bodies belonged to three young men. And they had all been shot with what appeared to be buck shots from a shotgun. What's that? At close range. So a buck shot, it's what you would use if you were killing like a deer oh. um so it sprays like li little bullet fragments yeah oh. it's like meant to oh okay. mortally wound whatever it is being okay. shot. Mm -hmm. and it was close range too yeah so this was this was massive injuries that okay. we're talking about it also appeared that they may have been drug to where they were laying like possibly from the road to okay. the spot they were laying or just from somewhere else Police searched the area around them, and they found a campsite nearby. There, they found the remains of a campfire and a guitar propped up on a tree. Police continued to search the scene, and they found shell casings from shotguns, but they were three different calibers okay. of shell casings, meaning there were three different guns. Mm-hmm. So all three of these men had their wallets in their pockets with their IDs and money still inside. 
So they were able to identify them that way. So they had 15-year-old Michael Hadrath and then brothers, 18-year-old Stuart Bade and 14-year-old Dana Bade. Okay. So these are young young people, teenagers. Mm -hmm. So police continue to search the area, and as they did so, they actually ran across a fourth body, also shot with a shotgun. He was, like, located near the campsite. Okay. Kind of in the woods, but near the campsite. And this was 18-year-old Roger Isom. They did not find any guns in the area, and there were no vehicles mm -hmm. there as well. So it was just the bodies. Mm -hmm. Poli so nothing had been taken. Their wallets weren't taken. Their money wasn't taken. Some of them were wearing jewelry, nice clothing, sneakers. Even the guitar was mm -hmm. still there, propped up against the tree. So robbery wasn't a motive. And none of the young men had any injuries on them other than the gunshot wounds. So it didn't seem like they had been in a fight or an altercation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Police were totally, like, dumbfounded as to what happened. And they knew that there were likely three murderers, like, out roaming the streets. Mm -hmm. right. So the pressure was on really quickly to solve the case. So all four of these boys were from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, right over the border from the park. Police notified the families of their deaths, and all of them were shocked. As police began, like, none of them had any, they weren't involved in anything nefarious. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any enemies. Like, it was just so random, it seemed like. As police began investigating the case, a young lady walked into the Sioux Falls police station. She said her name was Sandra Chesky and that she was 13 years old and that she had been in Gitche Manitou State Preserve the night before and she needed to tell them what happened to her and her friends. Okay. Okay. Sandra asked if the boys were okay and she was told that they were in fact found dead. Oh. So this surprised her. She seemed really surprised by that. Wow. Okay. okay. So something happened, but she didn't think they were killed. She knows them? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. This is her, these are her friends. Okay. So she explained that she and her four friends, Roger, Stu, Mike, and Dana, so the ones that were found, had gone out to the park the night before to play some music and set by a campfire. So she and Roger were dating. They okay. were boyfriend and girlfriend. They indeed took a guitar, played some music, lit a fire, smoked a little bit of weed, and they kept hearing things in the woods. Mm -hmm. And at first it sounded like it was animals or like a raccoon or a possum or something like that. But eventually it became apparent that someone or someones were kind of like stalking around their campfire. Mm. And it was like they were doing it to harass them almost and mm -hmm. scare them. So they kept calling out, like, who's there, what do you want, kind of thing. And eventually Roger and Stu started to walk, like, in the woods towards the sounds. And as they did, three men appeared with guns and just opened fire. Just walked out of the woods and boom, boom, just shot. What? So Roger immediately fell and was silent. Like, mm -hmm. he was killed instantly. Stu, the other young man, fell to the ground and yelled, I got shot. Like, they shot me. So Mike and Dana, the other two boys, grabbed Sandra and, like, ran into the woods and hid. Hmm. So the men started towards where they were hiding, and they yelled that they were the police and ordered them to come out with their hands up. The men said that they knew they were smoking marijuana and that this was a drug raid. Oh, okay. So t terrified, these teens, I mean, they were young, like 13, 14, 15, young kids, came out of the woods with their hands up, and Mike yelled, who do you think we are? Like, who do you think you're shooting at? You, we're not drug dealers or whatever. Huh? And one right. of the men just shot him in the arm. Like, said huh? nothing, just shot him in the arm. Okay. So the teens were then told that they needed to walk down a trail to wait for the sheriff. So they were ordered, like, at gunpoint by these three men to, like, walk down this place for a sheriff. 
And they're not thinking like police shouldn't just walk into the woods and open fire without even announcing themselves initially. I'm sh- yes, I think that they were. <laughs> Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. I'm just thinking yes. like they're kids, so maybe they weren't thinking that, but like wow. No, I think they were like, This doesn't seem right. Yeah. Like yeah. something is weird here. But they're also right. terrified and being held at gunpoint. Yeah. Right. So as they were walking, the three men started to refer to the to like themselves and each other as the boss, hatchet face, and JR. Yeah, you know, those are common police officer right. names. They were also in regular clothing, not police uniforms, and they definitely did not have police guns. Mm -hmm. Like, they were carrying hunting rifles. Right, right. So they were telling the teens that they were in a ton of trouble and would likely get five to ten years in jail for their crimes. So the teens were asking about the other two men, like, well, what about Roger and Stu? Why did you shoot them? Mm -hmm. Like, what the heck? And they were told that they were actually just shot with tranquilizer. And they would be fine. Huh. Okay. Which is weird because, first of all, Stu was, like, screaming and moaning and crying in pain. Mm -hmm. And Mike was shot with a gun in the arm. Like, and was right there. So. I would imagine that they make a different sound, too. A tranquilizer gun versus a. Yeah. A tranquilizer gun would be like a dart gun, right? Right. Right. Not a shotgun. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But again, they're kids. They're terrified. Mm -hmm. And also, they don't want to believe that their friends are dead, Mm -hmm. that they were just shot. So as they walk, they eventually came upon a road, and there was a brown truck parked there. Sandra was ordered into the truck by the one that was called the boss. Okay. He told her that he was going to try to get her out of this, like, mess situation because she was just too young to go down for it. And she was the only girl. And he was like, I know that weed wasn't yours. Mm, Like, you're too young to get busted for this. I'm going to help you. So they put her in the truck. He told the other two men, Hatchet Face and JR, to wait with the boys until the police arrived. Hmm. Okay. So as they drove away, Sandra looked back and saw Mike and Dana, like, walking down the road at gunpoint with these other two men. And she started to pay very close attention to, like, her surroundings, the mm-hmm. inside of her tr- the truck and all that. So it was an old brown Chevy, and it had a cracked windshield, and there was an inspection sticker, but it was in a weird place. Hmm. So she, like, noticed that. And then in the back, like, windshield, the long windshield in the back, there was a gun rack where wow. this man put the shotgun. Okay. As they drove, the man told Sandra that her friends would be fine and they would be taken back into the police station once they came to, like, not to worry about it. And he said, I'm going to do what Mm -hmm. I can for you, though. So the boss said that they were almost out of gas. So he pulled into what looked like a farm, like an old farmhouse. And there was, like, it looked abandoned. Okay. But beside of it was, like, one of those red gas cans. So he took that and filled up the truck and then got back in and they drove again to another farmhouse that also looked abandoned. And as they pulled up to that, Sandra noticed that the other two men were there as well. So the two men at the park, Hatchet Face and JR, were there, but her friends were not. Okay. So the boss got out of the truck and walked away with Hatchet Face. And he yelled back to JR to watch Sandra, keep an eye on Sandra. Trigger warning here. JR then got in the truck and pulled Sandra's clothes off and violently raped her. Oh, I knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. He then got out of the truck and smoked a cigarette until the other two men came back. When they did, Hatchet Face and JR got into another vehicle and left. And the boss ordered Sandra to get out of the car. So at this point, she's crying. She's Mm -hmm. telling him, listen, I'm a virgin. I'm only 13. Don't do this to me, whatever. And he was like, I'm not going to do anything to you. I just want to see how much how much guts you have. So he grabs like a club out of the back of the truck and said that they were going to go into the old abandoned house and look for critters and see Uh if he could scare her. It's all very strange, right? So weird. Right. 
So she absolutely refused to go into the house, like kicking, screaming, hitting him. She was like, heck no, dude, you are not taking me in that Mm -hmm. house. So eventually he was like, fine, whatever. Get back in the truck. I'll take you home. She's like, okay, totally shocked, whatever. But she, it's 430 in the morning at this point, by the way. So this was hours and hours and hours. So she did. She got in the truck. She told him where she lived and he started driving her to her house he told her that if she told anybody who they were or what happened that he would come back and kill her and he said that he wouldn't get any trouble for anything anyway because he was a police officer he's like nobody's gonna believe you first of all second of all i'm a policeman these are my people they're not gonna do anything to me and he drove her home literally dropped her off in front of her house and drove away isn't that insane that's it it doesn't none of it makes any sense whatsoever. Like, none of it. <laughs> nothing that just happened makes no. any sense. And no. it won't. Exactly. Okay. So stunned and traumatized at this point, Sandra just ran upstairs and she woke up one of her brothers. She said that she was scared to call the police because she didn't know if these men were actually mm-hmm. police officers or not. She's like, I don't know if they were telling me the truth. I'm scared to call. What if the you know, obviously the police are corrupt. So she's Mm -hmm. super afraid. Her brother said that nothing that she told him sounded like normal police officers Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And that she really needed to report what happened to her. But Sandra was so scared and adamant that she did not want to do that, that he eventually was like, okay, go to bed, get some sleep, and we'll see how you feel in the morning. Like if once you've calmed down, your adrenaline is not going as badly, like you're not exhausted, we'll decide then. So she did. She got some sleep and she woke up around nine the next morning. And the first thing that she did was she started calling Roger's house. So Roger's Mm -hmm. boyfriend repeatedly calling, calling, calling until finally his mom picked up. And his mom said that Roger hadn't come home last night and that she just assumed he was likely sleeping over at a friend's house, which is something that he normally did anyway. Mm -hmm. He's an 18 year old Mm -hmm. kid. Like she doesn't always know where he is. Sandra she didn't want to get Roger in trouble because she was like, well, maybe he is sleeping at a friend's house and she didn't want to be like, well, we got in trouble with the cops last night. Yeah. They're arrested. She she just didn't say anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So she called a friend of hers who came over and she just decided that they needed to go back to the park. Mm -hmm. She was like, I just need to go see if like, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. Let me go back to the park. But they didn't have a car. She didn't want to ask her parents because she didn't want to get in trouble. So they started walking and they decided that, okay, well, let's just hitchhike, you know, back to the park. It's the 70s. Right. Yeah. It was a common thing to do back then. But before they did, she ended up calling – she stopped at a payphone and she called Roger's house one more time. This time, she was pretty hysterical. His brother picked up the phone. So she was like, okay, this is not a parent, Mm -hmm. right? So let me just tell him. So she said, I need to talk to Roger. And he's like – who's calling and she's like, listen, this is Sandra. I was with him at the park the night before something happened and I really need to speak to Roger immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, by this time, Roger's family had already been informed that he was found. So brother, not wanting to say this over the phone, like, well, Roger's dead. He was like, where are you? I'm going to come and get you and bring you to the police station. And she was like, fine. That is what we'll do. So he did. He picked her up, took her directly to the police station. So Sandra, remember, who was 13, little baby, she's telling the police all of this with, like, such confidence and in such detail. And honestly, the story was so unbelievable that the police didn't even believe her. Oh, no. Like, especially the part that about the boss just letting her go. Right. Like right, she was yeah, sexually like why would he? Right. She was wit- witness four murders. Well, two at least murders, right? Mm. And she clearly saw their faces, their vehicles. So they were, were suspicious that she had been involved somehow. Like that she knew more about what was going on. And obviously they were like, something's missing here. Like this makes no sense. Why did they do this? Mm-hmm. Why did they let her go? So they're like – Tell us more, girl. Like, you are leaving something out. This is too unbelievable. So she immediately – she was treated like a suspect. She was read her rights. She had a mugshot. Oh, she, had, she was fingerprinted. She was even given several polygraph tests, which she passed. 
And her story never wavered. I was going to say, if it never changed and it was never. like, this is what it is. I, I, I half understand their hesitancy about mm-hmm. the story. Like, I get it. I do understand. But she's 13. Mm-hmm. Like. Right. And she was really re-victimized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By being treated this way. Eventually, they did believe her. They started to believe her. And they were like, okay, let's just say your story is true. And also, they were like, well, somebody did this. So mm-hmm. we need to find who it is. And she is the only person who can help us do that. And probably didn't do it by herself. So she can at least right. lead us, help us find. Yeah. And she didn't. She didn't have anything to do with it. She's absolutely right. telling the truth. I just, just want to say like, that right now. At least... At least keep it going down the road where, like, okay, well, she can help us in some way, even if whether we think she was part of it or she wasn't, and this actually did happen to her the way she's saying it. 100%. Exactly. They also, and I will say this is good on them, they were worried that she was a target, too, for these three men Mm -hmm. because, you know, she was their only witness. They could change their mind. Yeah, they let her go, but then they could be like, well, that was stupid. Let's go back and kill her. So they wanted to put her somewhere safe, but they didn't have anywhere to do it. Like, to take her at short notice. So they actually ended up taking her to a juvenile detention center where she stayed until they could set up a safe house for her. But, like, they knew she would be monitored there and no one comes in and out, you know, no access. But I can't imagine. I mean, this poor girl, she's gone through this traumatic thing. She's super young and then separated from her family and sent to, like, kid jail. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is just horrific to think about, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she helped to do sketches of the three men and of the truck, the brown truck, that, and they were distributed everywhere. Police decided that since Sandra had such a good memory of, like, the locations and things, that maybe she could identify one of those houses that she had been taken to. So they did, like, a radius around, um, like, the park, around the crime scene, and they started pinpointing all of the abandoned farmhouses like that they could find mm-hmm. that met the description and they took her to them. They started like driving her around to all these houses. Eventually Sandra recognized one that had the red gas can on the side of the house. Mm-hmm. And she was like, Oh, this is where he filled us up with gas. That was the place that the boss had taken her mm-hmm. at first. Unbelievably as they're sitting there, guess who drove by the boss, the boss man. In his brown truck. Sandra sees the truck and she's like, that's him. Mm -hmm. That's literally the boss right there. And they're like, no freaking way. And they're in a police car? They're in a police car. Two policemen and Sandra. So Sandra was put in another car. And the officer went after the guy in the brown truck. And he was pulled over. The man matched the sketch that Sandra had done of the one who was called the boss and the truck matched the description that she gave them perfectly. Like it had a cracked windshield. It had a gun rack in the back. The inspection sticker was in the correct place where she said it would be. So this man driving the truck was 29 year old Alan Fryer. Mm. And Alan just so happened to have two younger brothers, both of which matched the description of the sketches that Sandra had given of the ones called Hatchet Man and JR. So one of the brothers, 21 year old James, so that's JR, mm-hmm. was actually in jail at the time of the murders, but was given work release. Like to, he had a, worked for a towing company yeah. and he had not reported back to the jail until around 3 a.m. the night of the murders. Yeah, okay. So he's in jail murdering people. Yeah. Yeah. The other brother, 24-year-old David, he matched the description of the one who was Hatchet Man, and he had, like, pretty bad pockmarks on his face, and so I guess that's why they called him. Oh, yeah. So Sandra identified all three of them in a lineup, and they were all arrested and charged with murder. Okay. So let's talk about the victims really quick, because I haven't told you about them. Yeah. So 18-year-old Roger Norman Isom was born May 31st, 1956, to parents Ed and Nettie. Isn't that so cute, Nettie? Yes, I love that. <laughs> I know. And he was one of 12 children. Oh. There were six boys and six girls. Wow. Roger was a really good mechanic. He loved to paint, 
and he loved to play music. And he was supposed to be graduating high school the following May. So he and Sandra met at a drive-in theater that summer. And she said that he was the most handsome boy she had ever seen. I, oh, that's really I sweet. I, I, ha- I had a question about this earlier and I didn't bring it up because it just, I don't know. But he was 18 and she was 13. Mm-hmm. That's quite a yeah. difference. It's quite a gap. Age. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is. Yeah. And that comes out actually later. Um, okay. But he was a very good young man. Like okay. truly very good. Right, yeah, and, I wasn't – I'm not yeah. trying to accuse him of anything, but I was just thinking like that's like my oldest dating one of my middle guy's mm-hmm. friend, like friends. Yeah. I, which I, seems I, strange to me. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I know, not that this means anything really, but Sandra was very grown for her okay. age. She had to grow up very quickly. Okay. Okay. Just because of her life. Okay. Um. What's really sad, though, about Roger, his mom ended up passing away, like, a year after the murder, which I think Uh. is so sad. Okay. Stuart W. Bade, or Stu, as he went by, he was also 18, and he was Roger's friend. They went to high school together. He was born June 6, 1955, to parents Elwin and Marion, and he was the second of five children. He was a very gifted musician and played guitar. That was his guitar. That was actually found on the tree. Mm -hmm. He and his youngest sibling, Dana, who was also one of the victims, had dreams of forming a rock band together. Oh. So Dana E. Bade was born July 28th, 1959. He was very soft-spoken and very well-liked. He was the youngest of the family, so he was the baby. So Stu and Dana were actually really close. And as I said, they were really close siblings and friends and they had a joint funeral and are buried side by side oh how nice yeah 15 year old michael robert hadrath or mike was born october 16th 1958 to parents robert and marilyn and he had an older brother who went by the nickname wild bill which i thought was just so interesting (laughs) i don't know why but so mike was a really talented athlete he played okay. basketball and baseball. He was everybody's friend and was very protective over those that he loved. And he also went to high school with Stu and Roger, and they were all friends. Okay. Mike also worked a part-time job for UPS while he was going to high school, and he was able to buy himself a van. So he was like the friend with the car. Right. You know, right. those are yeah. always like the best one. Sandra actually attributes her survival to Mike's bravery and like quick thinking because when the shooting started, he very calmly told her not to run. Oh, and she knows for a fact that if he hadn't, she she wanted to run, and right. he's like, "No, don't run. They will shoot you." And she knows that she would have been shot immediately. Wow! If he hadn't told her that, so she was like, "He is the reason that I am alive." Wow! And they didn't know each other before that day. Oh wow! Yeah. So in June, okay, more unbelievable stuff. This one I was like, you got to be. what do you mean? How? You got to be kidding me. <laughs> okay. Wait for it. Wait for it. In June of 1974, so the murders happened in November. Mm-hmm. This is June now. While awaiting trial, Alan and James escaped from prison. So JR and the boss. So they were in a cell and the prison had new locks like installed on their doors and they d- forgot to weld the locks on theirs. And so he, they were able to like shimmy the door off of the thing and escape, stole a car, fled the state and then ended up hitting a pedestrian and were apprehended two days later in Gillette, Wyoming, which was oh, yeah, over yeah. 500 miles from where. Come they on took guys. Off from. Can Come on, you guys. believe this case? Like, what else? The, yeah, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it ridiculous. Is. Okay. So the three brothers, Alan, David, and James Fryer, all had separate trials, which lasted a total of 18 months. Mm, okay. Sandra testified against all of them, and her testimony was very strong and courageous. She was extremely determined to get justice for her friends. Wow. Like, wow. she was very heroic in the trials and mm-hmm. through the whole process at 13 years old. 
So it turns out that the three men had been out in the park that night hoping to poach some deer when they came across the five teens. They saw they were smoking weed and decided that they wanted to steal it. So they devised this plan to pretend to be narcotics officers so that they could, like, confiscate the weed. They claimed that the teens had become aggressive and things escalated, and that's what happened. I was going to say, you walked in shooting. This was not, like, trying to take weed. You walked in shooting. 100%. So they were all found guilty of three counts of murder and one count of manslaughter, and all of them were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What about the rape? Yep, that's my next thing. Okay. So this is upsetting, actually. So because all three were going to be spending their lives behind bars anyway, police decided not to charge James with Sandra's rape because they wanted to avoid her having to testify about it in trial. But from what I gather, Sandra was not consulted about this decision and was, like, actually pretty pissed. Right. Yeah. I mean, at least give her the choice. Like, okay – should we do this? Do you feel like you would want, like, be able yeah. to testify? Do you want justice it? for this, or do you want us to just, since they're in jail, just drop this? Like, right. yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, I know, I hated that. Okay, so Alan is now eighty years old. David is seventy-five, and James is seventy-two, and they're all in prison in Iowa, and they were in their twenties, so they wow. really have spent their entire lives in prison. They all, all their appeals were denied, and all that. Okay. So Sandra, our survivor, Mm -hmm. she was in seventh grade at the time of the murders. So she grew up mostly in Minnesota. Her parents divorced when she was pretty young and her, and she had older siblings too, all brothers. Um, her stepfather didn't love the kids and didn't really want them around. So her and her siblings actually spent like a few years with their grandparents. Then they were sent into foster care at times and then she also spent a year at a boarding school for native indians because she was part native okay okay sandra's family did come back together in 1973 and they all moved from minnesota to sioux falls that summer like the summer before the murders Mm -hmm. and then she very quickly met roger and then met friends and that's how that transpired sadly After the murders, Sandra was hounded pretty strongly by the press because this story is freaking bananas. Right. Yeah. Three men walk up to a bunch of teenagers, shoot them for no reason, sexually assault one, then let her go. Wacky. Right. So she actually had a lot of – there was a lot of victim blaming going on as well because they were saying why was she – you know, she's this young girl and she's hanging out with these four older guys. She must be trouble. Mm -hmm. She put herself in this situation. I mean, just nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. But because of this, she, like, kept her head down and stayed silent. Like, she was shamed. She felt shamed. Mm -hmm. And she was called the gitchy girl by the press. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, So she just didn't speak publicly. She didn't, she never told her story. She never defended herself. Nothing for a long time. She got married and she had two sons, beautiful sons. They're very beautiful. I saw pictures. She became a teacher and specialized in reading and writing. And she always stayed in touch with the four boys, like their families. And she refers to them as the boys, like very affectionately, Mm. like, you know, So finally, after years and years and years, Sandra decided to speak out about the truth of what happened and to tell how heroic the boys were actually on that night and to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. So she ended up consulting with Mike's best friend and his wife, and the three of them together wrote a book in 2016 called The Gitchy Girl. Where she told her story. So she took her power back. I read the book. It's very good. It's in her words. I mean, it's it's a good book. It really is. So I'll give it away. I promise. (laughs) Someday. (laughs) Someday I'll give it away. And she now enjoys speaking out to tell her story and to tell the story of the boys. So she's open about it now. It just took her like 40 years, sadly, to be able – to feel comfortable enough to do it. But I watched a documentary that she's in, which I'll link, which is 
very good and she, she she it's her on the documentary as well as Mike's best friend who helped write the book. Yeah. That's wow. the case of the Gitchy Manitou murders. Wow. I know it, girl. That... I told you it took me a long time to research because it was like, how – holy crap, how did this happen? Holy crap, how did this happen? And now they're escaping prison. Like, man. Jeez, those poor guys, like, wrong place, wrong time. For real. Like, well, I mean all of them, her too. I didn't mean to say just the guys, but just because they're dead. But, um, man, that that was wild. Like, yeah, I – it was a brutal case. Like, yeah, just, I, I, I'm, I was shocked by also, every turn. I'm, well, yeah. I mean, yes, especially once you get to the point where they escape. What the hell? But um, I'm also like, did we rethink this work release thing? Yeah. <laughs> because. Oh, and I tried to to find what he was in jail for. Right. That's what I'm wondering. And I think it was a violent offense. Like, I want to say it was like assault or something like that. He, so I, I did learn a little bit about these three men. Like, they were all pretty, like, sociopathic type. Like, people didn't like them. Right. They were trouble. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm not saying that just because this guy was on work release, this wouldn't have happened because maybe those other two would have just done it on their own. You know, like. Right. Maybe. And but, the, but and I think the most haunting thing is there was literally no motive. Oh yeah. Also, sorry, I'm going back to this whole work release. So he didn't go back to prison until like three in the morning, you said. Mm-hmm. How does that work? How did it work then? Like I would imagine that somebody would have to escort you to the job. I have no idea, dude. And no, his brother back? dropped him back off. Like, I don't get. After I don't the, get it. I don't get it. I'm like more fascinated with that whole concept. I know this was the '70s, so clearly I don't think it has to be the same. Oh, right. I bless. I don't know. Wow. 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 Yeah. No. His brother, like, they murdered all the four people. Mm-hmm. Sexually assaulted Sandra, and then his brother just took it back to jail and dropped him off, and was like, right. "See you later." Right. Gosh. Bye, brother. Um, also, I would imagine that now there's probably no rape kits back then. Now there would be like a rape kit that would also help no, she protect did, her from she did have to a, testify. True. She did have a sexual assault exam done and a physical exam, but like no DNA. Right. Yeah. That's what or I'm anything like, now like that. there's at least yeah. DNA where you can be like, uh, this is what you did. You did this. And yeah, you I don't even need her to come into court to say it. <laughs> that's what you did. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. I um I do think that it was confirmed that she was sexually assaulted. Okay. So yes. Wow. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad that they got caught. Yeah. Thank goodness for her. She's a smart lady. I know. I don't know how they would ever even figure out who this was if they hadn't if she hadn't right. come in. Like where would they have even gone? And started, mm-hmm. except with the bullets. But even then, I guess forensic wasn't even a thing. So it's like, would they be able to trace those bullets back to him? You know, like. Right. Yeah, anyway. I think so. I don't know. Um, they didn't find the guns, by the way. They ended up um, throwing the guns in like a lake or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thanks for diving into that and reading a book and. Mm-hmm. Spending the time. Gosh. Mm-hmm. That's, uh... I mean, I'm very glad that they let Sandra go, but that was stupid. That was the dumbest thing they ever did. It was. It was. Yep. That was like, why? And it... and did, did the boss man know that she, they, he, the other guy sexually assaulted her? Yeah. Uh, they say no. Oh, okay. Because they were walked away. And she does say in the book that they were not there. Right. So I don't know if they knew that was going to happen. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like that maybe that guy was like, just give me a couple minutes. Right. You know, like that's please what go. my assumption of. Yeah. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not, they're saying no. Right. Right. Cause like, where'd yeah. you go? What'd you have to do at an abandoned farmhouse? Right. Like, did you go look for those critters that you were going to take right. Sandra exactly. in to look for? Like, yeah. Right. Anyway. All right. Well, another, another day, another doozy. Mm hmm. <laughs> What in the world? I I would say what in the world is this world? What is this world coming to? But this was way back when. Not even now. This isn't like some crazy story that happens now. 
this is crazy that and then yeah anyway. 1973 yeah and yet and there the pictures of the boys they really genuinely do look like 70s kids like playing music by a campfire smoking weed mm-hmm. in a van like it was yeah it was a vibe see and this is the time that we were all out by ourselves and mm-hmm. this still happens so why are we so scared for every why are we just we're more scared now than we've than anybody else i know so, the world is anyway. scary it is scary hey hello mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just go right into that yep <laughs> Yep. <laughs> well, Some I can't point. wait to on social media yeah. for the book. Yeah. So I was going to say, find us on social media for the book with Beth. We'll give it away in about six months. Um, and <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm giving you such a hard time for it, even it's though okay. like, it's I know I did drop the ball on certain things like in the past too, with like giveaways. Cause sometimes you're just like, Oh crap, we didn't get it done this day. So then you just forget about it. But anyway, yep. it's just funny. Cause literally I knew you completely forgot hundred percent about it. Because I'm like, wow, this is on here. And so then I just said that text Two weeks like, ago. Hmm. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I think you just sent that like hand on your forehead emoji lady. Like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway, um, go find us on social media for that book giveaway and pictures. See of these these um, yeah. handsome gentlemen. Yes, and they are. Sandra, hopefully, yeah, a picture of her too. So I do. Um, anyways, and go check out our Patreon because we will be having a new episode um, coming up. Clearly didn't have a chit chat. Sorry about that, guys. We just didn't get to it because that would have been last week. But we will have oh, crime yeah. coming up. Yeah. Yes, we will so, have a crime. Anyways. Um, and always remember the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets.